Okay. Okay, if you can handle people coming in and stuff. Yep, we'll do. I just try and get myself sorted. Everybody hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. Okay, welcome everybody uh, to another London XL meetup. Uh, today we've got Robert Mundigal uh, to take us through some analytical and interactive dashboards. Uh, I'll let Robert introduce himself properly. Um, I'll just go for my usual uh, introduction chit chat. Uh, so first of all, for anybody who's new to Zoom or new to this meetup, maybe at the bottom of your window, like depending what device you're using, but typically at the bottom of your window, uh, you'll see access to a chat group, uh, which people are using right now. And uh, we'll probably pop a couple of links in there at some point and feel free to use it to ask your questions, engage with other people who are in this meetup and, and what you need. Uh, there's also a... Uh, clippy arrow there to mention the drop down list at the bottom uh, so if you wanted to directly message myself or, or somebody else in the meetup uh, feel free to do that but then just double check what that drop down list says you know switch it back to everyone if you want to engage with a group uh, the other thing I normally say uh, is about upcoming events uh, some of it is a little bit vague but they're coming in fast uh, the only one you can see on the website at the moment, meetup.com, uh, the only one you can RSVP to is the next one, which is on Tuesday, the 15th of September, uh, with Patrick here talking about converting JSON data, uh, which is coming from SurveyMonkey, I believe is his source, and normalising it into an Excel table. And then we've got a, a few others in the works, uh, which... I kind of confirmed, but I haven't actually set them up on the website yet. So you'll be getting some emails and notifications about those in the upcoming week, really. Uh, I didn't want to send you a million emails in one week. <laughs> what with this event, and I sent that survey the other day. I thought, right, I won't publish these just yet. You'll be sick and tired of me. Um, but to let you know, you can see there that on Wednesday the 30th, if you want to make yourself free in your diary, cancel all those dinner invites or breakfast, depending on what your time zone is, uh, that we've got Abiola David coming in uh, virtually to take us through some modern features. So I think it's going to be things like uh, import from PDF, XLOOKUP, uh, maybe some data types, but a bunch of the kind of new features that are out and coming out uh, in Excel. Uh, then I'm going to try and get one booked in on either the 14th or 15th of October. Uh, kind of talks on that going on. Be one of those dates we should have something all fun as a topic. Then we've got Tuesday the 27th. We've got Roger Govier taking us through the let function uh, and probably a few friends uh, to show us some examples of using it and then ultimately create a report from it. And then Wynn's going to come in on the, it should be the 10th of November, uh, to take us through some Power Query. And that one, that 10th of November, will probably be about lunchtime UK time uh, because he'll be delivering from Perth, Australia. Uh, so it'll probably be a kind of lunchtime one. The rest will be at the normal time, but you'll get notifications of that in due course. So uh, hit that juicy attend button when you see it come through. Um, I mentioned a survey a moment ago, and a lot of you will know that because you got the email from me. Uh, thank you, everybody who's responded. I think we've had about 112 responses so far, and it's been great seeing your, you know, your views on how the meetup's going and what you like, uh, what you might dislike, and where you'd like to see it go, really. So I'm just looking through that. Um, there's some good ideas in it, which I'm going to try and uh, take on board, and uh, we'll see how that affects kind of meetups to come. Uh, hopefully you appreciate looking at those events that there's a lot of variety you know so we've got quite a technical one with the json data from patrick but then we've got a nice modern thing we've got some formulas we've got some power query and there's gonna be something sandwiched in the middle and trying my best you know today is about dashboards and charts and conditional formatting and the like uh, trying to do my best to add variety 
uh, something for every everybody, no matter your role, your experience, your skills, etc. I'll put a link to the survey, the form, um, in the chat box um, as soon as I finish talking and, and Robert gets going. So if you've lost that email or you, you didn't receive it and you'd like to put your your two pennies in, as we say, uh, then I'll, I'll I'll put that in a chat in any, any minute now. Uh, but that is enough from me. So if I can stop my share and uh, Robert, if I can ask you to to introduce yourself and uh, show some Excel magic. Yeah. Hi, Alan. Hi, Taya. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to present my small little knowledge about how to create uh, uh, Excel dashboards. Uh, we will have we, we have quite an agenda. So if you don't mind, I would just jump right into it. Um, now here you go. Let me put that away. So short in introduction. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Short Good. introduction about me. No worries. I won't bore you with my story of my lifetime. I'm a business intelligence consultant for data analysis, data visualization, financial modeling, and also simulation and optimization. I'm based in a small little village close to Munich. It's called Aschheim. You may have heard of it in Financial Times recently. Uh, it's uh, where you know the big financial scandal, Wirecard, has its headquarter, and I have absolutely nothing to do with that. <laughs> I'm just living in the neighborhood. Uh, I have a small little company called Clear and Simple Analytics. Uh, I'm the founder, owner, CEO, COO, the IT support, and also the janitor. <laughs> what I wanted to say is I I'm the only employee, so it's just me, okay? But it's a real company, yeah, a limited. So I'm blogging at a small little blog nobody knows. It's called clearlyandsimply.com already since 2009. Uh, I'm not blogging on a regular basis. I have done quite a few blogs this year, uh, but uh, I had no new blog article uh, in 2018 and 19. So you see it's kind of in regular. And I'm using Microsoft Excel since 1990. I haven't used it very intensively in the first 10 years, but since let's say end of 90s, beginning of the uh, 2000s, I, I'm working with Microsoft Excel a lot. I'm not only working with Microsoft Excel, but it probably makes around 70 to 80% of what I'm doing uh, in my professional life with Microsoft Excel. So what are we going to do today? I will start off with a little showcase of an interactive dashboard. You see a screenshot here. It is a fully flash analytical interactive dashboard of 10 years of the English Premier League. Why do I, why have I chosen uh, sports results? Because they are publicly available and you can do a lot of things and it serves very well for the techniques I want to present today. Okay, we have a, a four to five minutes look at the showcase just to keep you motivated. And then in the second part of the show, uh, we will go through a couple of step-by-step -step demonstration of five formula-based techniques and maybe one bonus VBA tip. I don't know how much time I will need for everything. I did some trial runs, but they were all a disaster. So <laughs> let's wait and see how this is going. So what are we going through? Sort by formulas, as you can imagine, sorting by formulas is extremely important for sports data because you want to show the table and you want to have to that be sorted by points and goals and stuff without the user having to sort manually. So you need a sort by formula. Then highlighting and selecting items across all views of the dashboard, meaning I'm highlighting one team and it will be highlighted in all views on that dashboard, be it a chart or be it a table. Then number three, charts in tabular views. So how can you spice up your tables uh, so provide all the detailed information, but also visuals which help understand data and dig into the data. We will talk about conditional formatting, spark lines, and what I call minimized Excel charts. You will see what I mean by that. Number four will be slices and timelines on tables. Important is here, I'm talking about slices and timelines on data tables, not list objects, not on pivot tables. And we can use that, those as interactive filter controls. Number five, if we have the time left, will be dynamic icons 
automatically adjusting according to the shown data. That means just as you can may see in the screenshot on the left, the icons of the team logos adjust whatever view you're looking at. And finally, five lines, only five lines of VBA code. So people not working with VBA, don't go away. If we have the time to go there, uh, I will show a very, very simple piece of VBA, which uh, really makes uh, a great impact on, uh, uh, on interactive dashboards. This is the agenda. Both workbooks will be posted for free download on clearlyandsimply.com after the meetup. So uh, when this meetup is finished, I will write a little blog post and this should be up with the download links and this should be up, let's say, in two or three hours from now. Uh, also, uh, Alan Ortea, I think, will provide the links uh, maybe on YouTube or, or on the Meetup channel. Both, yeah. Okay. So let's jump into that showcase. It's a little small, so let me zoom in here. Now, what you see is we're looking at 10 years of the Pre English Premier Football League. And you see the table here on the left side with a lot of visuals in it, how many matches played, points, goals for, goals average, goals difference, and stuff like that, win, draw, losses, the last 10 games, the goal difference visualized, the last 10 results. On the right side of the dashboard, you see the fixtures and the results of the selected match day, some statistical overviews of this round and all rounds up to this round. So how many total goals, goals per match, stuff like that. And on the right side, you see um, the um, all-time table, all-time meaning the 10 years we have in the data set. So this is, these are the views. Now, as you can see, a lot of visuals within the table, we will show that. As you can also see, it will automatically adjust if I'm walking through by selecting another round. So the sorting adjusts automatically, something we will also co cover. You can switch to another season. If you want to, you can sort by goals four or goals average or goals distance, difference, sorry. I'll go back to points. Next option you have here, and this is the, the analytical part. Uh, you can see this is the, the entire table. So covering all games, the home and the away games, you can also go to the home games only or the away games only. And by that, you get a lot of insight supported by the table, of course, and all the, the visuals, and you have, can have a, a, a closer look into, into what your data tells you. Final or another one. Sorry. Is this, are these option buttons here where you can switch back to the two points rule, which I think was in place until 1994. So back then, uh, the winner only got two points from then on you got three points. So you can just switch everything to how would the table look like if only, if still the two point rule would be in. Now this is the interactive and analytical part. Another interactive part, and let me make it a bit smaller though you can see, is that you can directly click wherever you want and it will highlight across. So let's say I'm clicking to Tottenham Hotspur. Tottenham Hotspur will be highlighted here and highlight it over here. You can also directly click into the results table. And all views will be adjusted accordingly. Final part is a little time slicer, only applying on the table across all seasons on the all time table. So you can, just as you know from the pivot table, you can go here and use that slicer and it will then adjust the table above and filter that table by the selected time zone, time span. So much for the showcase. 
Any questions on that? I don't see the chat window at the moment. No questions yet. You're no good. questions yet. Oh, Carlos is raising hand. Oh. Did you mean that, Carlos? Oh, yeah. So I think I also read it. But, oh, yeah. I mean, uh, Robert, we have talked about this, but I, it, it seems so well designed. So uh, my, my question is, um, have you study or read about UX user experience in order to to have this uh, look and feel for this dashboard? Yeah, I, I, I read a lot, all type of you know books and uh, and and publications. Stephen Few, of course, Edward Tufty, um, um, whoever has to say something about data visualization dashboards and uh, and user experience and user interfaces, I probably had at least a look in it. But, uh, you know, most of the stuff, oh, the, the, I, I learned the most from talking to my clients because they tell you what works and what doesn't work. I mean, I'm not delivering sports data tables to my clients, but you can imagine that I'm delivering something that is pretty similar to that one and provides similar features. And they tell me what works and what, what doesn't work. And that this is where that comes from. Cool. Okay. Cheers. Okay, let me close that one. And let's go um, to our workbook. I will not just as a, as a um, management, the expectations, we will not create the entire dashboard here. That's not possible within an hour. I mean, it's possible within a couple of hours, but not within one hour, especially if you want to explain it. But I will, I will try to cover everything that's on the right side here. Um, and to explain the main techniques on a simplified data set. And we will not go through all the formulas because many of them are just aggregating data and they are not really worth looking at it or you can look at it and dissect them if you have the workbooks at hand. So I will just focus on, um, on those formulas and, and those techniques which, uh, which I wanted to present here. So let's stop with the data, have a look at the data. The data table is pretty simple. There is the round or match week or whatever you want to call it, the date, home team, away team, home goals, and away goals. That's pretty much the data table, okay? Which is indicated by the blue ones. This is my style that I'm saying the blue is data. Now here are the gray ones. And the gray ones, I'm adding row-based a couple of formulas which help me to simplify my aggregations. This is no rocket science. If you look at here, I hope you can read that. I increased the font size. It just says if home goals uh, is smaller than away goals, then it's a, then the home points are zero. If home goals equals away goals, it's a one because it happened a draw and a three otherwise, which means it's a home win. And this is the same for away. It just says in this game, Liverpool defeated Norwich 4-1 and Liverpool had three points and Norwich zero. Pretty simple. Home result and away result does pretty much the same. It just reduces that to one is a, is a victory, minus one is a loss, and zero is a draw. There are three more columns that will come. We will come to those later. And finally, I have a second table, which I need for only one visualization, but, but I included it, which simply says it states at which rank each team was in each round. For instance, after first round of this season, Bournemouth was number nine and Liverpool was number three. And if you go down, if I go down to the table, you see here, the last day, as we all know, last match day, Liverpool was number one, Man City was two, Manchester United was three. So this is the data we're gonna work with, okay? Now, onto the first technique, which is sorting by formula. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, you may ask me, since we have um, Microsoft Excel 365, what's the big thing about sorting by formula? I mean, you have, this, you have the function sort now, uh, and it's pretty easy to use that and pretty straightforward. But if you're in the same situation as I am, 
you often can't use Microsoft Excel 365 because the people you're working for don't have it. My clients all, except for one, all are on Excel 2016, some of them even on 2013. So something like I'm shown here, this one, you know that, this gets a sorted list of the teams, a sorted unique list of the teams. And then I'm doing calculations here. Let me show that just for sake of it. It's pretty much it's some if formulas. It's some if home points when the home team is Bournemouth and uh, the round is smaller than the selected round index. Plus the same for away if Bournemouth was playing away uh, and uh, the, the round was smaller than uh, smaller or equal than 20. So these are the formulas, very simple. And in Excel 365, you then do nothing else than say, I'm sorting this table by column six of the tiebreaker. And I do that descending a minus one. So that's easy, right? But what if you don't have 365? You still want automatic sorting. Let me start with this. This formula here, this is the pre-Excel 365 equivalent for creating a unique list of items. I won't go into that one because I probably would need half an hour to explain how that one works, but it does nothing else than just creating a unique, unique list of teams. In our data set, we wouldn't even need that because we're just looking at one season. But if you're looking at 10 seasons as shown in the, in the showcase, you need uh, an option to select the, the current 20 teams which are playing. And then the other formulas are just sorting that now alphabetically starting with AFC Bournemouth and ending with Wolverhampton and Wanderers. I won't go into that one because this is not what I want to cover here. What I want to cover here is I'm now, as you can see here, I'm just fetching this one as it is down here. And then I'm doing a couple of calculations. I'm calculating the points. Again, these are some if formulas, nothing to write home about, pretty straightforward stuff. I have to talk about this one for those who are not familiar with football. Um, there is a tie breaking rule, which means if two points, if two uh, teams uh, tie in points, then uh, the next criterion is goal difference. And if they are same in points and goal difference, the next one is goals for, not goals against. That's an error on my side. I'm sorry. So now what we have here is points is, you know, the main criteria. If not, then we weight goal difference by 0 0.01. And if those both of them are, are uh, e uh, equal, then we will weight goals for by 0 0.001, just to have a tiebreaker for all the teams. So this is just the usual stuff, nothing about sorting. Now let's try to sort that. A couple of steps, but very simple formulas. The first thing we have to do is we have to transfer the tiebreaker into a unique number. So each team needs a unique number. Uh, now you may argue that by the tie breaking that they should be unique already and they usually are at the end of the season, but in the first or second or third match day, uh, a lot of teams are, are equal in all three criteria. Okay. So what we need, what we are doing here now is we say sort dummy, equals this one, the tiebreaker, which we want to sort by, plus the index of that team divided by a very large number, let's say 999,999. ,999. 
This doesn't affect the sort order. It just makes sure that each number occurs only once in this list of 20 teams. Okay. Now we sort this sort dummy by large, sorry, equals large, So now they're sorted, okay? But that doesn't tell us much yet. And now we define, we find the position of this sorted list. We just say equals match. And we're looking for this one in this list. And we want an exact match, okay? And now we can easily, we, we know the position of, uh, the, of the one with the most points in this list. So what we now have to do is a simple index formula. And we say index the team Now you may wonder about this. Why have I done that? Why am I not just going with at position? Because if I'm doing it that way, I can drag it over. And I'm done. Okay. So let me show you the difference again. If I would use that one, and then drag it over. Oh, sorry. It's not working because it uses team sorted here. It increases the second one and so on, okay? We don't want to do that. Got the idea? Any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, there's two, but it's kind of one really. Um, I think it's uh, Brian just asking really about the, you know, the pros and cons that you're using tables and formulas versus a pivot table. Oh, tables have a lot of a lot of pros. A lot. Of, I mean, they have mainly pros. Um, number one, the most important one is if you're using data tables, um, Excel takes over the entire range management for you. You don't. You never have to care again about does my sum here really covers the entire new data range? Did somebody add something at the bottom and? You know, my formula sums up to row 1000, but in the meantime, there are 1100 rows. You don't have to care about that because you are summing a column in a table and it will always take the entire table. So this is the main advantage. The second one is that I like a lot is it populates automatically the formula across the entire column. So you just, you don't have to copy anything down. You just enter the formula and then uh, write the formula, press enter, and you'll populate it down to the end of the table in, in, in that specific row. This is very helpful. And uh, what's also very helpful is that your formulas become much more readable. Now, in former times, you always had, you looked at a formula and there was kind of a complex sum if in, and then it said, yes, yeah, sum if, you know, the column C from one to 3,000 at that uh, uh, worksheet, and uh, based on the value in, in column B, and you never knew what you were referring to. But here you know, okay? You say, I'm indexing the team and by position. Or if you're on another worksheet, you're saying, I'm summing the revenues here. 
I'm summing the profit here. So it's much more readable with tables, okay? Basically, it's all named ranges, okay, by creating a table. So I would highly recommend to work with tables. It's a time saver, okay? And for very good reason, all Power Queries, if you download them into Excel worksheets um, or load them to Excel worksheets, create auto automatically create the table. So it's a great feature. You know, I actually have a follow-up question to that. I was the one who asked that. But specifically, if you're dealing with very large data sets, wouldn't those formulas slow down Excel? where it wouldn't be as efficient if you were using a pivot table? I mean, you mean, you mean when I'm writing formulas here like that, you can do a lot of things with pivot tables. And if you just want to analyze large data tables, large data sets, I would recommend the pivot table too. Of course I would. But you know, working like that gives you full flexibility of what you're doing. A pivot table always comes with a couple of disadvantages especially when you use it on, an, on, a, on a dashboard with other views and uh, other things you want to do with it. It just is a pivot table, right? I mean, there are pivot charts too, but they're also limited. But I agree with you, if you have really, really large data sets, okay, it's not a good idea to write row-based formulas because it just slows stuff down. So you should think about loading to the data model or do some preparation in Power Query um, or, as you said, work with, with, uh, with uh, pivot tables. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cheers, one. Okay, next thing I want to show is uh, that we can also make that even more dynamic by saying uh, we let the user select what to sort. And I will demonstrate that shortly. You can go to the de developer tab and we say, we insert an option button, and I'm not doing much on, um, on formatting right now, just trying to show the main thing. So let's say, sorry, we format that one, and we link it to a cell I prepared up here. which I call the sort criterion. Let's go back down. And copy that. And I'm inserting that. Now let's try whether that works. If I'm putting a one, I'm having here a one. And if I'm selecting goes four, then I'm having a two. So this cell now tells me what the user selected using the option buttons. Now the idea now is pretty simple. We have that sort dummy and we say we define that hard coded to be the tiebreaker, but now we say choose this target cell of our option buttons. And then if it's a one, it's the tiebreaker. And if it's a two, it's goals four. And if it's a three, it's goals against. And if it's a four, it's the goal difference. That's it. Everything else can stay as it is. And that works. Okay. Now, another option would be with second option button to or two other option buttons to let the user decide whether to sort ascending or descending. I will not go into the details here. It's pretty much you would have another target cell for two more option buttons. And this target cell would be here, the sort order. And then you will go into your uh, sort column and say, if ascending is selected, then you use small. And if descending is selected, you use large. And that's it.
That's all about formula-based sorting. So that's a short recap. All you have to do is you need, <coughs> I'm sorry, you need this little addition to make sure that the match formula will work afterwards, which makes each number unique. Then you sort it with large or small. Then you use a match to detect the position. And finally, you use an index to get the team, the point, the goals for of that position. Okay. That's it for uh, sort by formula. Any questions? I uh, don't think so. Okay. So let's head on to select and uh, highlight. The idea as shown before is that we select one team and then highlight that across several views of a dashboard. I will make a couple of examples. So let's first insert an interactive control to select something. So we go with the combo box, I'm putting the combo box here. And now I'm uh, formatting it and saying, yeah, he should, sorry. The input range is what we calculated back here. So an alphabetically sorted list of our teams and the cell link shall be this one. And 20 teams will fit on the screen, hopefully. So we don't want the user to need to scroll. And now we have this. And as you can see, if I select Burnley, it's number five. If I select Wolverhampton, it's number 20. Next thing is we get the name of that index by, by a simple index formula. Just say, okay, this list again, and this one. Now we have the name. Okay, let's start with a simple table. And it's, it's as simple as can be. It's just conditional formatting. So you go home and say conditional formatting, a new rule. I'm using a formula. I'm saying equals what is in dollar C 20 equals what I calculated here. So the selected one, and now I'm formatting it. And I'm saying the field color shall be, I don't know, let's go with that blue, right? Now, does that work? It looks as if it works. Okay. Good. Can I also do that? I created a, um, a result, a cross tabular results table just to show that this works for rows and columns too. So please note that since I'm using abbreviations here, I need the full name and I have hidden that up here. So I will be referring to that row and that, not to this one because this has just Arsenal and not Arsenal FC and just Wolves and not Wolves Wanderers, but that's a minor issue. And now we go and say, we select the entire table and say conditional formatting, a new rule, and we use a formula to detect which cells to format. And now we say either or um, this one. I hope you can see that it's a bit small, right? equals that. And the other condition is if this here, and we just lock in the row number, equals, again, this here. So now I've done something wrong because I went here with 19, but I told you I have to go with 17 because in 19 are the abbreviations. Now let's see if that works. We format that, 
and we use again the same blue. We'll just take a copy of it before you leave the window, Robert, and dump it in a cell so we can see it. Okay, sorry. No, it doesn't work either. anyway. Oh, it works, okay. So <laughs> let me see if I can do that. Manage rules, edit rule. I see, yeah, you just copy into a cell. Sorry. Cheers. Here it is. So it says, it basically says, okay. It says, if this one equals the selected one or this one equals the selected one, then fill that cell with the blue fill color. Okay. Yeah, great. Cheers. That's a nice view, by the way, I think. So, so much for the tables. So you can see, you can format uh, rows and you can also format uh, columns with a very easy trick, very simple formulas and, uh, um, and conditional formatting. So the next one is we have that simple chart of visualizing the, um, the teams by points in a bar chart. And now we wanna highlight the selected one, which will be what for the FC at the moment. The idea is now to create a second data series and saying equals, if this, sorry, done something wrong. Yeah. If this, so the current team in this table equals our selected team, then take the points. Otherwise, give me an NA. Copying that down. And Watford has to 34, okay? Now I'm copying all that. I'm selecting the chart and I'm pasting it in. Now, if you have a closer look, that does not look perfect because they are not overlapped. But that's easy fix. We just say, we just format, selecting the data series, format the data series which is not working at the moment for whatever reason. Where's my format dialog? Oh, here it is. Now we say we want a 100% overlap. And let's say we go with a 35% gap width. Now that looks better. And the last step is simply go here and say, we go again with this blue, which is not exactly the blue as in the cells, but it's pretty close. So you would have to change the RGB colors now to make it really exactly the same blue because the predefined uh, chart field series are not the same as the predefined standard cell series, cell, cell field series, cell field colors, sorry. So again, it's simple. I'm just creating a second series, which has no values for all except for the selected one. And then I'm making a 100% overlap so that the bars are sitting on top of each other. And I'm, still, I'm formatting the, um, the selected one with the same color I want to use to highlight. Maybe one, I have two more, but maybe I'll go just with one more. We have a table ranking with a lot of data here. Let me make that a bit smaller. So we have the ranks here over the season. Now these are the ranks of the first match week, second match week and so on. And these line charts visualize the development of all the teams across, uh, across the season, across the 38 match days. Now let's add a selection, which simply is equals index 
of this here. And we already know the number because the number is the target sale of our combo box. Drag that along. 38 ones. Now we add a data series. We add one, we call the series name selected. And use the calculation as the data. We finally, format it in blue. That's it. Now you can see that whatever you choose here, let's go with, I don't know, let's go with Manchester United. It will be highlighted here. It will be highlighted here. It will be highlighted here. And this is actually Manchester United. I have one more example, but that is pretty much the same as the bar chart. So it's just like, um, I'm having the additional data, which are the annual series in, in million British pounds and the points they're having. And then if you wanna highlight these, um, these dots in the XY scatter plot, you would just add two more series saying, if this is my selected team, then take that one. And if not, give me an NA. And here, if this is my selected team, then take points, otherwise give me an NA. And then you will bring this one as an additional XY scatter series to the chart and format it in blue. Have I lost you guys or are you still with me? Still yep. here, Robert. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. Any questions? So much for the, for the selecting and highlighting. Any questions on that? There are no questions, not in the chat anyway. Okay, so. Uh, next thing I want to cover is how you can spice up your tables by, um, uh, by adding graphical and visual elements. So I'm pr having pretty much the same table again. So it's, uh, um, it's the teams and the points and goals for and stuff. And I'm adding um, how, how, much, how many wins, how many draws, how many losses. Again, these are not very complex formulas and you can easily uh, find out how they work if you have the workbook available and have a look at it. It's just adding two count ifs, pretty much the same as the sum ifs. It's counting here. It's it's not no big deal. And these ones are um, I'm calculating here the results of the previous ten weeks. Okay, current week is included, so it starts over here in R10, and then it's calculating which is match day, match week 20 at the moment. And it says it's 19, 18, 17, and so on back to 11. These formulas are then just calculating, um, uh, did they win 10 match days away or 10 match days ago? Did they have a draw like this one or did they lose the game? And this is just the development over time. Okay. Just for the data preparation. And I'm doing the same for the, uh, for the position. And this is, isn't a too complex formula too. It's, it's a sum ifs again. And uh, the, the thing to, to remember here is that I'm distracting the sum ifs from 21. Why am I doing that? Because I am uh, using spot lines later on to visualize that. And I want the first team to be up and the 20th team to be at the bottom. So to reverse the axis scale, that's not possible in spark lines. So that's why I'm putting, you know, uh, I'm turning the first team into the 20th team and the last team into the first, first team. And maybe I'll, I'll show you later on. Well, let's start here with adding, um, with adding visual elements to charts. Now, first thing we can do is um, 
we can visualize points very simple by conditional formatting. So what I'm doing here is I'm just getting the points from the table here. Now I'm selecting the entire range. I'm saying conditional formatting data bars, a solid fill. And now I'm managing this rule. I'm editing it. I'm going with a darker color maybe. And I want to show the bar only, not the value. And boom, I'm having a nice little in parentheses bar chart. Another way would be um, to visualize the change. Well, with change, I mean the change in the table, the ranking in the table between this week, between last week and this week. Okay. And I've calculated that up here. Let me show you that. Um, so this was the rank last week. This week, this was the rank last week. Rank change, none. This is a rank change of one, rank change of minus one, and so on. Bunch of if formulas. I, I don't think it, you know, adds much value if I go into that detail. Just let me show what I can do here now. We say here equals. what I'm calculating in the rank change. I'm copying that one down. I'm going home, conditional formatting, icon sets like that. And now we format it again and say, we want to show the icons only. And this now shows that unchanged since last week and this week, went one up, went down, went down, went up. Okay. Right. I'm going to skip that one because I think, how much time do I have left? Ellen, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Uh, yeah, well, um, how many examples you got? Two, is it? Or does that include the v VBA one? Yeah, I have actually three left, including the VBA one. So let me, let me try to finish that one and at least the, the next one. Uh, so I'm going to skip that one because uh, you can have a look at that. But that's in, it's just not using condition of, uh, it is using conditional formatting, but it's not producing the icons by, uh, uh, by, by conditional formatting, but inserts icons based in a formula. Now, right. um, what you can also do here in, with conditional formatting, I think you all know that. I'm going to the, uh, sorry, goal difference. Going to the goal difference here. No, only that. Copying that down. I'm wondering why it's not showing. And now it's showing. And now I'm saying conditional formatting and I can use a, a heat map for instance for that to visualize the goal difference. By the way, if you don't know it, to hide numbers, uh, you don't have to format the um, the font color, you just go to custom formatting and type in three semicolons. The number's still there, but you don't see it anymore. Okay. This was conditional formatting. Let's go to um, spark lines. Let me, let me show one. I'm just selecting that. And now I'm going to insert spark lines which is uh, which is here, and I'm going with a win loss. And now he asked me for the data range, and the data range is exactly this here. Those ten I showed you before. Okay. 
Okay. Because it's not valid. Okay, let me try again. Let me try again. Anyone knows what I'm doing wrong? Or maybe I did not select. Ah, it, it seems the problem so is I only selected 19 and tried to, to populate 20 into the spot line. That was the problem. Exactly. Thank you. Now you have that here and we format that saying we want to have like a win is green and the loss is red and we want to have the axis shown, horizontal axis, show axis. Now this shows you that that team, Liverpool, won all the 10 matches. They lost two, had one draw, but before that they had seven wins, stuff like that. So you can do the same with a line here. Let me show that one again. Um, insert a spark line. And now I'm going to the positions. And now you have those. And you can also format them, say like axis, they should all use the same axis, same vertical axis, and you can highlight the top points in green and and the low point in red. Okay, now here you have your spot lines. And they're all dynamic, you know? Whenever you choose something else, another match day, another sort of order, whatever it is, they will all update automatically. So the final thing I wanna show you is, um, what I call minimized charts, and I will only make one. I prepared three of them. So a bar chart, a simple bar chart, a stack bar chart, and even kind of a tornado chart. I will only go with the wins, draw losses. So let's go here, up here. Let me try to make that smaller so you can see more. I'm going to select these columns and I'm inserting, um, I'm inserting a 100% stack bar. Bringing that down here. The important thing here is that uh, we have to remember that this will be upside down. So this will start with number one and end with tw number 20 though. First thing, never forget is say categories of the axis are in reverse order, all right? The next is we can get off, rid of everything. The chart title, we don't know. We don't need the percentages. We don't need this axis. We don't need the grid lines. We format them nice and say, uh, a win is a green, of course, and a loss is red. And in between is something like, I don't know, amber or gold, like this. And then we say the chart area has no fill and no line color. The plot area has no fill and no line color. So we have kind of a minimized chart. And we can now align that to fit where we want it have. So here's one, one tip you may have heard of, but if not, I'm gonna tell you, positioning something on dashboards, which is sitting on top of your, of your worksheet. And this works with uh, charts, with shapes, with uh, form controls, whatever is sitting on top of your worksheet, pictures, whatever it is, uh, you can easily resize and format them by keeping the Alt key pressed during moving and resizing. So keep the Alt key pressed and the chart will snap to the grid, okay? 
So we draw that down. Even once more. And the great thing about it is that this even works for the plot area. So if you select the plot area, it also snaps to the grid. Now you will probably select that again and say, we're only using like 35%. And here you have a great in-table minimized Excel chart showing the wins, draws, and losses, even with a little legend legend underneath or caption underneath the chart. So much for charts in tables. Questions? No questions in the in the chat, Robert. Anybody still here or? <laughs> oh yeah, they're all still here. People are <laughs> making some good comments. Okay. okay I'll yeah. be leaving it till after, my friend. Okay. Okay, so um, slices and timelines, okay? Um, as you certainly know, slices are not only available on, um, on pivot tables, but also on list objects, on structured tables like that one. So you can select the table and then, um, oh, that comes into my way uh, all the time. Uh, you can insert a slicer. You can select any of them. Before we do that, we have to make a little setup. So first we're gonna, we will turn um, the date of the match into the first of that month of that year. So it's date of year of, no, forgot the equal sign. It's date of year of the date. and month of the date and one. So this just turns everything as you can see. So I format it by date into the 1st of August and the 1st of September and so on. So the next one, and I will come to that why I need that is I'm writing a formula to decide whether this row is in the filter or out of the filter, okay? And I'm using subtotal for it. Most of you will, will use subtotal usually like that, equals subtotal of nine of the home goals, right? So 576 home goals in total. If you go now for, I don't know, Arsenal only, they had 24 home goals. Right? So this is the usual way. But what I'm doing here is, and what it does, it, it does not consider the ones which are filtered out, which are invisible. It only takes into account the ones which are applied to the filter. And this I will take advantage of by saying, equals subtotal of three, which is count A of the home team. Now, now this has only a one in, there's no filter set. But if I will set any filter, the ones which are not visible anymore because they do not apply to the filter will have a zero in here. And this then is the, is the uh, heart of the solution of calculating something on a table based on is the data row relevant because it applies to filter or is it not? Most important thing to know is to see this here. So the subtotal is not going across, sorry. It's not going across the entire column, it's just going on that specific cell. And if that specific cell is visible, subtotal three of home team will return a one, and if not, it will return a zero. 
Okay. Now let's insert a slicer. I'm a bit annoyed by that drop down menu of Zoom, but it works. <laughs> It and we use the just created column month. And it gives us that. Now, you also have to understand or have to know that um, the slicer does not have to live on the same worksheet as the table. So I can simply take that out here and copy it somewhere else, like here. Okay. And what I'm having here is, and I'm going to explain that a bit. I'm having formulas here, which are based on that column. I just tried to explain that in filter table. It says, sum if the home points column, if the home team is Bournemouth and in filter table has a one. So this sum if formula will not calculate or not sum up the ones which are out of the filter which have a zero in that column, which are not visible. And the same for the away points. And now what I can do here is I can just select one and it will filter everything down. Although it's not a pivot table filter. The basic idea or the main idea is just saying, let me go back here, is just saying, Subtotal three of that specific cell returning a one if it's visible, which means it's it's in the filter, or a zero if it's out of the filter and invisible. And I'm using that as the subtotal as a as a condition in my subtotal calculations. Okay. The disadvantage of uh, um, of tables or slices on tables is tables do not provide timelines. So this is possible, but this is not kind of an intuitive way of selecting times, right? But you can get around that with a workaround. And this is probably the last thing I can show you today. So let's take that out again. And uh, we insert a pivot table, you know how to do that. And we put it on an existing worksheet I prepared here, over here, okay? So, and all I'm doing, I'm dragging just the date in, only into rows, okay? Now I'm right, let me make that a bit larger so you can see it. I'm right clicking on that and I'm saying ungroup to get to the pure data, day by day, okay? So you see, it's everything from starting at the 9th of August down to the 26th of July. Okay. So the next thing we have to go back to the data table and we do something similar as we've done before. We create a second filter and we say this in filter pivot, which means we check if this data row applies to the filter set on the pivot table. And this is equals if is an A of match. And we're looking for the date and we're looking for, let's go with the entire column B. I'm usually not doing that because I don't like writing formulas like that because but since I do not know how the pivot table will uh, you know expand or collapse or have more rows I'm going across B now and I'm looking for an exact match now what does that say is an a match date pivot table across B0 it looks for a certain date and said is it in the pivot table visible and if it's not, this will, the match will return an, an NA. So is NA of match will be true. And if so, we want to have a zero to not include it in our calculations. And otherwise, it should be a one. So 
Now, all of them are a one, okay? Because I haven't filtered the pivot table yet. But I will do that right now. And that's as simple as one, two, three. I'm just going to, yeah, if he lets me, come on. Uh, insert timeline, and I'm inserting a timeline for the date. Here's my timeline. Now I'm copying that back to my workbook here, and I'm inserting it here. And I have another table here, depends on what you wanna have. And this is pretty much the same technique as before. All it says, it's now not the sum if, the second condition of the sum if is not going on the other in filter, but on our new in filter pivot. And if it's a one, it sums, and if not, it doesn't. And now you can go here and say, I'm starting in, I don't know. Now let's try, let's start in March, April. And thereby you can filter your table. Okay. So any questions on these techniques slash workarounds? Don't think so. No? Okay. Okay. So I can go on if you want to, Ellen, or what you think? Um, was it just the VBA thing, is it? No, it's the dynamic icons, but this was already covered by Jandu in his session. Oh, yeah. Yeah, true. Or the VBA thing. Let me know. Carlos is pointing to the vote. Can we skip to the VBA bit? Okay. Okay. So, um, is this just like five, 10 minutes, is it, Robert? Yeah, yeah, I will, I will cut it down to, to, to five or 10 minutes. I, I, I can talk an hour about it, but I will cut it down to five or 10 minutes. So number one is you have to understand that there are event-driven procedures in, uh, in VBA. And I'm going to the VB editor and an event-driven procedure always lives in that, as you can see here up in the, in the VBE, uh, each, each worksheet has an object in Microsoft Excel object. And uh, the one we want to have an event-driven procedure is the one we're currently on, which is the sheet 10, 6 VBA. And you can select the, oh, let me try to do that here. Uh, you can select the event-driven procedures from here. Sorry. Worksheet. And it automatically inserts the selection uh, change event, which is the most important one. I'm just trying to maximize my VBA so I can see that. So there are others too, like uh, uh, what should happen when uh, the worksheet changes. So a cell value changes on the worksheet. What shall happen when uh, a pivot table value change is what shall happen before the right click, before a double click, before something's the, before the worksheet is deleted and stuff like that. So whenever something like that happens, the according event sub will be fired if you define it, okay? So let's go with a, with a example, with a simple example. I'm now saying, let me go just back to the, let me say in this cell in C10, I only, I want to see the address of the cell or cell range I clicked on. Okay. So I go back to the VBE and I say range of, what was it? C10, C10 equals, and now the target by range, this is what is up here. That brings us back where the user clicked. This is the range the user changed the selection to. Equals target dot address. Now let's see if that works. I'm clicking somewhere and it says K9 now. 
Look at that. Okay. So I'm look, clicking here. It says age eight. See that? So it fires every time and it does what I'm telling it to do when the selection change. Even I can even select ranges. Now that you selected I6 to K18. Okay. Now, how can we make that um, useful for us? Uh, let's say we want to have that, uh, that idea or that interactivity um, I showed in the showcase where you can click into the table and uh, the selected team is automatically changed. Now, what we, what we need to do here is uh, um, first we need uh, range names to address in the BBE. I already defined them. Uh, this one is called my selected team. And this one here is called my table. Okay. Now, and everything else we already talked about. So if I'm having a one, two, so there is conditional formatting in place. What I now want to achieve is that if I click here in Tottenham Hotspur, this number here in C36 changes to six. So the conditional formatting would jump in. And how do I do that? There is a VBA command saying application dot intersect. And you can pass ranges to that, uh, to that command and it will return, you know, the, how do you say that in English? You know, yeah, the intersection of the, those ranges. So which cells do the two ranges or three ranges have in common? And it will return nothing if they don't have anything in common. So what we will try to, to check is we will check target, which is, as I tried to explain before, the one where the user clicked when, the, when you changed the selection and range of my table, which is the name where my table lives, right? So if there is an intersection, it will return an address now. I'm putting that into a, an if clause. I'm saying if not application intersect, let me put it the other way. Maybe it's easier to understand like that. If application intersect is nothing, then there is a yeah missing then do nothing else do something and if so this part of the if clause will only be that there is no intersection between target where the user clicked and the range of my table where my table lives which means there shouldn't happen anything the user just clicked outside now if he clicked inside so we're in the else clause we're now saying range of my selected team. Was that the name? Yeah. My selected team equals target.row, which brings back the first row of the target where the user clicked, minus range of my table dot row. Question, will that work? Let's see. It doesn't work. It works in general, but it returns a number one smaller than it should return. Why is that the case? Because what I showed here, target.row is the absolute row on the worksheet and range of my table.row is also the absolute range on the worksheet, which means 
my table dot row, my table starts here, is 44. Okay? And if I click here, Sheffield United, then it's 52. So from 52, I'm subtracting 44, and this is 8. So I have to add 1 to get to where I want. And that's it. Here you are. And look at that. I mean, application intersect is not the simplest VBA command ever, but look at that. One, two, three, four, five, six lines of code. And you can do a lot of thing with it. Okay. So I'm already talking way longer than I should. So I think I'll call it a day for my presentation right now. And let's go to the Q&A if you want. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Robert. Let's, let's say that straight away. I think that's the thing with the, the VBA at the end is you don't always, you know, it doesn't take much to do something useful. You know, just a, a little bit of a code just to take it over the over the line. Sorry, I I, I didn't. I think I don't, didn't didn't understand the question. <laughs> no. Say it I again. Question. I was just saying at the end with the VBA, uh, and you said it was only five six lines. I said it doesn't take much uh, to do something useful. Yeah, it, that's exactly the case. I mean, um, very often, you know, I'm using VBA. Let, let me let me make one one more example. Let's go back to the. Uh, I won't I won't go into the details. Just show it what I'm doing. It's unstoppable now. Huh? <laughs> no, 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 no worries, no worries. I just I just wanted to show something. Uh, there is one little functionality set which is here. Um, that by clicking in here, the uh, the scroll bar of the all time table is automatically adjusted that even if you click at Norwich, okay, it will automatically adjust the scroll bar to uh, to make Norwich City visible even if it, if it wasn't before, okay? And this is done by one simple line which simply assigns um, the actual value to that scroll bar based on a, a calculation on a cell. So it's just one line of code saying, please use the result of this cell as the actual value or the current value for that scroll bar. And it's really powerful. You don't always have to write like a hundred lines or a thousand lines of codes to get to something, you know? Indeed. So, I think I should try to get to the chat window or something to see something. Yeah, there'll be people in there saying thank you and telling you how amazing it was. I'm just looking for questions. I don't think there's any questions. I'm just scrolling up through. Feel free to get your questions ready, team. Um, feel free to ask it in person. doesn't have to be the chat. Mark, you can ask that question if you want to him. Unless you want me to. Hello there. Hi, Robert. Hi. Let me turn my video on as well. <laughs> there we go. Um, what's your view about uh, Power BI as a uh, as a tool? As you know, because you've shown everything in, in Excel, um, and there seems to be a trend towards uh, Power BI. And I'm not I'm not giving any preference either way, but just wondering what your thoughts were. Yeah. Um, truth be told, I'm not a Power BI user because uh, yeah, you don't want to hear that, but I'm a Tableau user for almost 15 years now. And uh, well, you can think of Tableau what you want, but they are a couple of years ahead because Microsoft has been very late to the party with Power BI, right? I mean, they're catching up right now, but uh, they are late to the party and I appreciate what they are doing, but uh, 
if I if I'm having to to analyze or visualize data based on on a, a larger data set and I don't have to do a lot of calculations or simulation or stuff, just analyze it. I'm using Tableau. Me personally, I'm using Tableau. But I can understand that Power BI, you know, uh, has a big hype right now, and um, they have to improve a couple of things. But it's a good tool. I mean, I think. Um, I was always wondering why they didn't, you know, merge the two pro, uh, products. Why is there Power BI and Excel? Why did they simply use Excel and put the Power BI possibilities into Excel? Because, you know, Excel would be the BI tool then, okay? Unbeatably, okay? But they just decided, that, I mean, they started like that by Power View and Power Map and what they did. But then, there's, then they, all of a sudden, they decided to create a separate application. Although both are both on Power Query and Power Pivot and DAX. So I, I couldn't understand why Microsoft made that decision. My hopes are high that they will merge it, okay? So that you have all the flexibility of calculations and maybe even TypeScript or VBA in the background to do whatever you want. And then you have that powerful, great interactive visualization engine of Power BI in the same application. That will be, that will be my vision and my dream. Okay, good. Yeah, question answer. Yeah. So, 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 Robert, if that happens, will you, will you be, uh, would you say Excel over Tableau at that point? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, you're, you're, I couldn't hear you. You're not loud enough. Call us, say it again. Uh, so, so if that happens, will you be, will that, will you say Excel over Tableau? Yes. At that point. Oh, if my. that happens, if that happens, <laughs> that's it. This is all recorded. <laughs> <laughs> and neither of them like me. Neither neither Microsoft <laughs> or Tableau likes me. So no worries. <laughs> I'm persona non grata in both companies. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, Romulus has got a question. I don't know if, it, if you want to ask it. Or if, can you see the chat, Robert? Actually, no. Do I have to stop the... Probably. You shouldn't have to, but... Now I see the chat. Um, so where do I start? MVP question. Yeah, it's, um, it should be in the bottom. It's just asking... Uh, hang on, let me look at it. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. You're welcome. Even later to the party is Google Data Studio. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, uh, why are you not, you're not an MVP yet? Yeah. Oh, yes, it's a little bit. No, that's just. Uh, it's about six up from that. Okay. You see, it's asking about hidden or very. What, what team I'm going for? I mean, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm German, you know. Make an educated guess. <laughs> now Liverpool, of course. Same stuff. Huh? Ah. <laughs> yeah, I figured. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there once was a, a compatriot of yours said. Uh, at Stephen Colbert, John Oliver said uh, about Jurgen Klopp that uh, he's a charismatic German and historically charismatic Germans need to be treated with care. I love that. I love oh, that. Man. We're still all the way here. Go Pele. <laughs> Messi, Messi's gonna go to Bayern. <laughs> Didn't hear that, Carlos. Oh no! I think Messi. What? What? Happened? Messi is gonna end up in Bayern or Manchester City. That's gonna, How is it? That's gonna be interesting. Uh, I don't. Well, I think Manchester City over Bayern. You know, but I think uh, that's gonna be interesting. And there, there's a there's a question from Romulus. Yeah. Um, will timeline work? Copy to another tab if uh, the helping worksheet with the pivot table is hidden or very hidden. Um, I never tried, but I think so. I think so. Why wouldn't it? Oh, yes, from here. 
Yeah, I don't think I've tried that either. Have you tried my through TypeScript yet? No. No, because I'm um, I'm I'm not using Excel online at all. So I'm not in TypeScript yet. Um, you know, Excel online. I mean, they're catching up, but there are a lot of features missing. As far as I know, you don't even have named formulas in Excel online. So I see TypeScript will be the next thing for programming Excel, um, but I haven't done anything yet. I don't think it will be so much different to any other programming language. You just have to learn a, a bit more syntax or something, you know? Yep. Last I heard, it's still in the beta. Anyway. Is that sorry, Brian? Yeah, I've done a couple of presentation things on that or attended them by now. And they're just kind of seeing what needs to be worked out. So it may even replace BBA at some point, but it'll still bring over the uh, all the legacy code and stuff, they say. Ooh. I don't know. <laughs> It'll be a while. Any questions, team? Other questions? Get your questions ready. Well, questions. If no one else has one, I have a couple. Yeah, go for it. Okay. <laughs> so I was actually talking to Sergio about this. Is he still in the chat? Uh, yes. Still there. Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay. How's it going, Sergio? Uh, good. <laughs> so I'm kind of can y'all hear me? Okay. I'm kind of working towards creating a custom database. So I've been doing a lot of these meetup chats lately to try to get an understanding of the tools that are available out there. And basically I'm trying to see if this Excel dashboard thing would be a good way to create kind of a pseudo database where I have multiple data streams coming in and I'd be able to use this somehow to manage those, maybe with Power Query like Sergio was suggesting, and then eventually put this out to something else. So. Do you think this would be a viable option for that? You mean a, a, a dashboard as you know the means to to uh, monitor what's coming in, in into your database, or in a sense, yes. But I'm also considering things like, say, blockchain, logic loop, stuff like that, because I want to try to automate as much as possible. Yeah, why not? I mean, dashboards are some pretty much nothing else than. One way of looking at your data in a in a you know visual appealing way and helping you to understand what's in there, you know, that depends on what your what your requirements are, what you really want to see. I mean, if you need graphical representation to find out like patterns or stuff like that, or having highlighted something if something doesn't work or comes in late or whatever it is, uh, then a dashboard can be a good way, right? I mean, mm. okay. always depends on what you, what you need. I mean. You, there is no, I mean, there are definitions of dashboards, but in the end, it's just, you know, it's just one view of this data, whether there is a table on or only a number or a, the most simple dashboard would show just one number, right? And well, then, essentially, okay. we're trying to get away from Excel. Like, it'll always be kind of the background part of it because all of our clients send information in Excel. But I'm go going to eventually create an actual custom database. And I've been looking at options like JavaScript, Python, Rust, Go, like stuff like that, just to see what's really out there. And really seems like power apps in particular will work well with Excel that create like an iterative loop where it goes from what I'm calling the pseudo database to the final version. I mean, I mean, if it's, if it's simply the front end, you, I don't see why you are, you should use Excel. I mean, Excel for me is, um, is the, the tool of choice if, if I have to do calculations on my data. I mean, if I just have, you know, a huge raw data set or a relational data table with a lot of tables, you know, 
Why would I use Excel for that? I mean, I can using a uh, Power Pivot and Power Query, but why would I? I mean, Excel comes into play if you say, yeah, this is my data. And now I'm transforming that by saying, I'm making a scenario analysis and saying, what if, you know, next, ne next month, my, I don't know, my, my revenues are 1% smaller than I predicted, and then visualize that. But if it's just, you know, if it's just crunching data, I don't see why you would use Excel. If it's just, you know, the front end of a big database, why? Well, that what if analysis would actually be pretty useful for predicting new products to go after. So, I mean, Excel definitely would have a place in the database. I'm just trying to figure out what exactly it would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, hard, hard to tell, you know, in general, need, need to, would need to have a closer look on what you're doing exactly. And uh, and what your what your maybe you can you can email me and we can chat again on a one on one basis and you show me what you need. We can talk about that. Thank you'll you. Find my uh, you'll find uh, in the workbooks I'm posting for download. Uh, you'll find my email address and uh, also my blog address where my where my my, my blog link where my uh, email address is is put. Okay. So what just send a message, right? The what? Sorry, I was looking at something. Yes. Uh, quick, quick query. I, I have a question though. I, I, I think I haven't asked this. Um, so uh, who, who do you look up to when you are like, or what, where do you get your inspirations to make these files or, or make these workbooks? You, know? you mean if there is any specific person I'm looking up to or, or, or yeah, I'm yeah, trying to yeah. copy? No, uh, I'm trying yeah, like for for inspiration or like I mean, um, yeah, basically, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, dashboards and uh, graphical visualizations are all over the place. Okay, I mean, you can't go online anywhere without seeing kind of a view or a chart, an interactive visualization, wherever it is. And I'm just looking at it and say, I like that. And I'm trying to, you know, rebuild that either in Tableau or in Excel, uh, if, if I like it. And of course, there are the usual suspects I'm, I'm, I'm looking at when they're writing blog posts for like, like Chandu or Jean Pelletier or, or, or people like that. Um, I'm reading all the, uh, all the stuff they are publishing. And then I'm just, you know, keeping my eyes open and looking, uh, nothing special, just, you know, I'm reading a lot of German newspapers and uh, they made quite some progress in the last years regarding data visualization. And some of them are making a good job, some don't. So just, you know, look out for it and uh, decide what you like and decide what you don't like. You see that question, Robert? Uh, Yeah, Romulo says, I got a Power Query question which put together more than 4 million rows. It cannot load that to Excel. How can I export those to CSV if I can anyone help? Uh, actually, you can hold it in the data model. You can't you know, load it into a worksheet, but you can hold the 4 million rows in the data model itself and then use a, a, a Power Pivot and, uh, uh, and, and DAX to analyze it, okay? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it, it's a good idea to hold several million data rows in Microsoft Excel, but uh, it's possible. Yeah. Mm. Someone else answered it. That's right, Pat. I have a few of those with a few million lines, <laughs> Power Query driven, and the files are 300 kilobytes in the end. Power Query runs the engine and just copy pastes the values into the, the rows and the columns. That's it. And there's purely graphic coming out of it, a uh, few power tables and few charts, and that's it. Dashboard done. <laughs> Cheers, Sergio. Look, it took a bit of time. I started thinking to, to well, it's, it's just, it takes a few days to set up the code and the DAX formulas with Power Query. And after that, it just refreshed data, done. You just, you just refresh your data sets from whatever source you have, either online, your ERP systems, whatever. Um, and the way, that's, that's the beauty. It takes a few days to set it up, but once it's set up, it's five minutes. And not, it just, that's it. 
it's very a lot of your senior management the leadership really appreciates that um because they get their inboxes instead of 10 megabytes files they get 300 kilobytes files in in their you can even link to powerpoint if you want to if you just link out of out of a shared service center a shared drive in your network company network and it's nothing it doesn't take any space at all so that's i'm a big fan of power query so that's what I mentioned to Bob in terms of like looking to Park Query because it definitely can definitely live to you. And then Robert, you're saying you've you've run the calculations. That's yeah, I run calculations all day. So um, I'm, a, I'm I'm in supply chain, so I'm in demand planning, so forecasting and mm -hmm. uh, seasonal trends and seasonality and several different models all the time. And I mean, solver is a big help. So <laughs> yeah, I mean my. Uh... The use case for me for Microsoft Excel and Power Query very often is to um, to connect to huge data sets, okay, and then using Power Query to aggregate, group, and filter them down to what I need inside the Excel model, and then I'm having you know that aggregated data in the model, in, in or in Power Query, and uh, and I'm transforming it then, and then I'm loading it to to to, to a worksheet, and doing further calculations on it, like forecasting or simulation or scenario analysis, stuff like that. And then I'm creating the dashboard. So this is my use case. You're coming from, I don't know, 10 million data rows, you know, aggregating that down to, let's say a couple of thousand or maybe a couple of 10,000 and doing something with it. And then, you know, creating the dashboard. That's my, that's the use case I'm having most often. And my clients like that, you know. Yeah, Ramos, I think this helps your answer. We sidetrack it a bit of your. Yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> uh, people asking questions about workbooks and stuff. So um, Robert's going to create a blog post and we'll make links to the completed workbooks available. Um, I'll add a link to that blog post in the description of the YouTube video. There's a link to that YouTube video in the meetup like page um, and I'll be linked to it from there. I'll also send out an email, well, either me or Tay, I will uh, send that an email tomorrow, which will have that link. So by tomorrow, you'll have access to all the workbooks that um, Robert's shown and also a replay of the, the video if you want to you know, rewind it and all that jazz, pause it, write your formula, go, yeah, all that. <laughs> So they will be available. Just give us a few hours or till tomorrow. Any questions, team? Or you just want to say hello if we're finished with questions and say thank you to Robert for his time. You're welcome. What's the, big, what's the biggest spreadsheet you've ever worked on? <laughs> In which terms you mean? Uh, file size. File size. Uh, uh, around about 90 megabyte. <laughs> <laughs> Which was uh, actually the, 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 uh, the, the performance was okay. It just, you know, took an eternity to open it, close it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not built for that. You know, it's just not built for that. In the UK, that's the moment you go and make your cup of tea. Hell yeah. <laughs> US is just Hell yeah. <laughs> when that's refreshing, you go get a tea. Yeah, that's definitely that. <laughs> that's it. I'm really sure how I stumbled into a London group, but I'm kind of glad I did. <laughs> um, it's all good. International. Thanks, group. Robert. You're welcome. Thanks for attending. Uh, but so I'll say the same thing. Thanks, Robert, for the insights. That's looking forward to get your file. That's I saw something in there that's definitely gonna include my power query. Great to hear. <laughs> Great to hear. Thank you. Y'all yeah, take it easy now. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Nice, nice chat. Thanks, Cheers, Alan. Thank you, buddy.
Vielen Dank, Robert. See you on the other side. Hi, Heron. You all right, buddy? There's lots of thank yous in the chat, Robert, as well. I don't know if you can see that, but there's been a ton of like thank yous and uh, saying there were good, good insights, good ideas. Cool. Uh, lots of love, which is nice, isn't it? <laughs> well, I think I'll head off as well now. Thanks, Robert. Uh, uh, the number of times I've wondered whether something is possible in Excel, and then I've Googled it and found out that you've really got the answer somewhere. So um, you've helped you've helped me out a number of times in the past. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good seeing you. Bye. 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 I'm going to close the YouTube stream now, but Zoom is still going.